Saints of the Americas is a series that seeks to share information on the life and times of the saints of the Catholic Church celebrated in the Americas. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle. Welcome to our show. We're going to begin by talking about Sister Mary Magdalene Bentivoglio. Uh, as you will discover, uh, her life as a poor Claire uh, was not always welcomed when she first came here to the United States. And then there was some uh, intrigue and disruption and investigations that took place uh, along the way. Uh, she was certainly justified, as we'll discover in the end. But let's talk about the beginnings of Mary Magdalene's life. Well, she is born in Italy. She is the 12th of 16 children. And at the time of her baptism, her name is Annetta. Uh, we know that she uh, has a desire to follow her older, older sister into the poor Clares of the urbanist rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, she took, takes at that time the religious name Mary Magdalene of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, we know that her sister uh, Constanza does not change her name. So that name will remain the same, but we will be talking more about Mary Magdalene. Uh, we know that after 10 years of the two sisters being in this order together, uh, they desire and ask to be transferred to a stricter order of the uh, poor Clares, the Sisters of the Primitive Observance of San Damiano. And uh, we know that this ultimately is granted and that they join this order. In 1875, both women are selected uh, to establish a cloister in the United States. Uh, Pope Pius IX requested the order's expansion in the United States, and the Franciscan Minister General supported the idea, uh, and uh, the Franciscan Order in Minnesota requested their presence. Uh, before they left, uh, Sister Mary Magdalene was named Abbess, and from then on was known as Mother Magdalene. Uh, and I think that kind of brings their, them then to the United States. And as you alluded to, uh, the order that they were part of, the rule that they followed, wasn't necessarily what was wanted here. Let's talk primarily about that first. Uh, their order was the Poor Clares. We know that the Poor Clares are a monastic order. Uh, they spend most of their life in ministry in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, when missionaries would come to the United States, in particular women religious, uh, the bishops that invited them were looking for women who would teach their children. And because they did not necessarily fall into that uh, charism of education, uh, but a charism of, of prayer for the world and for uh, those um, people in the world, they oftentimes were rejected uh, to find a home within a particular diocese. We know that when they arrived uh, to New York, uh, they received a message from the Franciscans in Minnesota uh, that again, were expecting these teaching sisters, uh, not cloistered nuns. Uh, they were not welcome there. Uh, they tried to go to Philadelphia. The Archbishop there uh, declined. Uh, they went on then to Cincinnati and again were uh, declined by Archbishop Purcell at the time. Um, and then uh, finally they, they go to New Orleans and uh, they were invited uh, there. They arrived uh, in 1877 and their first postulants joined them. Uh, what happens after that? Well, first, I think it's worth saying one of the interesting things about all of these different bishops rejecting them, uh, they were actually told that their uh, charism, their rule was, was in complete contrary uh, direction to what even the United States was about. Mm -hmm. uh, this need to expand, to welcome immigrants and to educate them. But we do know that there, there's found a great desire for uh, their ministry. Uh, we know though that they, um, when they arrive, uh, th there's a, an authority that's been placed over them and uh, because they were too far from other Franciscan houses, uh, they were told to leave New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And so you can only imagine that they've been passed up by all of these different dioceses. They think they finally found a home. Mm -hmm. They want to simply serve God in prayer mm -hmm. and in this contemplative model. They think that New Orleans is going to work out for them and it doesn't. Uh, we know that they, it was then suggested uh, that they go to Cleveland. And so the three sisters moved there in August of 1877, and their convent was converted from an old cigar factory. And so that brings them from 
all over the country being rejected, down in New Orleans, up closer to us, to the Diocese of Cleveland. And then interestingly enough, uh, their journey continues. And uh, from there, uh, they end up uh, in Omaha. They're welcomed there um, by the bishop and uh, they're offered a home. Uh, that, that home was eventually destroyed by an act of God, by a tornado. Uh, then construction uh, was begun, but wasn't really finished until 1882. And after uh, trying to found their community in these other cities, as you had mentioned, around um, the East primarily, uh, the sisters were finally able to put up a monastery uh, in Omaha. And as this uh, community grew uh, in Nebraska, they uh, invited other people into their community. And as they did that, there was um, some disturbances that happened along the way. And what did these two sisters, Sister Madeline and Sister Costanza, experience? Well, interestingly enough, while being rejected uh, in New Orleans, uh, once there's the establishment in Omaha, uh, there's a desire in New Orleans to have a community uh, such as the sisters initially were offering. And so we know that the second community of the Poor Clares of the Primitive Observance uh, was begun in New Orleans. And the Franciscan Minister General asked uh, Mother Magdalene if she would travel to New Orleans to advise the new community. Uh, when the bishop in Omaha discovers that she is absent from uh, the mission or the ministry in Omaha, he feels insulted uh, that she is neglected to tell him that she is gone. Uh, certainly, all of the religious would be under the auspices of the bishop. And so uh, he instructs her to apologize to him. She does, and he does forgive her. Uh, in 1888, though, Mother Magdalene and her sister uh, were denounced by an emotionally unstable sister in their community. Uh, she accuses them of uh, irregular personal conduct, of um, alcoholic intemperance, um, the financial mismanagement, and acting without the due deference to the bishop. Uh, the bishop at that time believes the accusations and asks for a formal uh, canonical investigation. When the investigation finds no uh, substance to the accusations, uh, the bishop insisted that another investigation be done, this one with the same result. And we know that uh, through all of this, uh, Sister uh, Mary Magdalene and Sister Costanza prevails. Uh, they founded the first uh, Poor Clare Monastery in the United States. Uh, in 1902, uh, Sister Costanza dies. And then three years later, uh, Mother Magdalene becomes uh, deathly ill. And uh, aware that she's about to die, she asks the sisters to allow her to lie on a mat in the floor, just like St. Francis. And she succumbs in 1905 uh, at the age of 71. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book called Saints of the USA by Brother Marco Bucarelli. This book for children ages six and up will fascinate young readers as they learn more about the saints of North America. Those who read it will meet 10 figures who have lived lives of holiness, as well as the Immaculate Conception of Mary, patroness of the United States. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts, at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224. The store is open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953-2443 or email at stpaulsbookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these saints of our time. We are in our seventh year, Cristo Rey Jesuit High School. One of the things that's unique about this school is that our kids work five days a month at offices in downtown Chicago to pay for their education. We got telephone calls the first day thanking us for sending us those kids to their companies. 95% of our kids are the first ones in their families to finish high school, and 87% of our graduates are in college right now. No one believed that it would be as successful as it is. Well, it's obviously caught on, and we're very, very excited about it. Welcome back to our show. Now we're going to talk about St. Teresa de Jesus de los Andes. Uh, let's talk about this uh, uh, Chilean born saint. Well, we know that she's uh, born in Santiago de Chile in uh, 1900. 
as we'll see, her life is very brief. She lives but 20 years. Uh, we know that uh, those close to her, her birth name was Juana, and those very close to her called her Juanita, a name that she's still known by uh, among many who study her life. Uh, her family uh, was a very devout and yet very well-off family, very involved in their Christian faith, uh, and also in their living out of that faith. So uh, while that might seem an odd distinction uh, to many, there is a difference between just being faithful but also living that out. And so her family did use its means to live out acts of charity, to live out a ministry and service of the church. We know that she was educated in the College of the French Nuns of the Sacred Heart. In her very brief but intense life, uh, we know that she had a desire to be a woman religious, but she always carried with her uh, an understanding that she would not live uh, into old age, that she was going to die young. This was always a premonition that was part of her. We know that um, she consecrates herself at the age of 14 uh, to uh, be a religious in the Carmelite order. She desires this more than anything. And so she enters a tiny monastery of the Holy Spirit in, uh, as we said, Los Andes. And um, it's about 90 kilometers from her birth home. But she enters this order and desires to start to live out this religious life, perhaps always with this intensity because she doesn't feel there's much time. And we know that uh, when she was clothed with the Carmelite habit on that uh, October 14th day, um, she then took the name of Teresa of Jesus, Teresa of Jesus. Uh, she knew a long time, as you had mentioned, uh, before that she was going to die young. There was some uh, premonition, and she felt that this was something that the Lord actually revealed to her. Uh, a month before uh, she actually departed this life at the age of 20, she related this to her confessor. So this was something that uh, other people understood. Uh, she accepted all this uh, with happiness, uh, with serenity, with confidence that uh, that was to be her lot and that was okay with her. Uh, she was certain that, that her mission uh, to make God known and, and loved uh, would continue throughout eternity. And we see that really in the life of religious. You know, the, the, their whole uh, charism is to depict and to make present uh, the spirit of Jesus among us. And so uh, she did this throughout her short life but then we see that continue uh, not only in, in the shrine that eventually we'll talk about in the end uh, that pilgrims go to on a constant basis to celebrate her life, but they do so giving praise and thanks to the Lord. And let's talk about uh, the holiness of uh, Teresa's life. I think as you point out, it's, it's important to note that that holiness is lived out in many ways. Mm -hmm. In some of the saints that we've, or people on the road to sainthood, uh, many of their stories might be filled with some rather um, grand uh, pronouncements or great activities. Uh, but we're reminded that it's that daily living of our faith with Christ. And so we're told that her holiness was uh, lifelong, though her life was short, that it occurred in her everyday living. We're just told of encounters at home, in college, with friends, with the people that stayed with her family on holidays. Every one of them uh, in every aspect of her life has witnessed to the apostolic zeal uh, that she always spoke of God, that she always desired to serve God. Um, she would talk about this as a young child to her friends. Uh, it was something that people always witnessed in her. And that is what the lives of the saints are to be for us. It's not always going to be in grand ways. And I think um, we ourselves set ourselves up for that sense of, well, I don't have any great accomplishments. Mm. And so sainthood is, you know, uh, distant to me. It's that daily living of, of our faith, our compassion, our care, our concern. And we certainly see that that was how she lived. And she did it, as we're told, very cheerfully, as you mentioned, very happily. She was a very sympathetic uh, person to other people, very communicative, and, and desired to, to really be with God's people. And we see this, uh, this whole uh, life of holiness and generosity and, and happiness continue uh, in her life as a nun from uh, May 7th, 1919, which was really the kind of uh, pinnacle for her in her life of holiness. Um, only 11 months uh, were necessary to bring her life to an end uh, after being uh, 
receiving this habit. And then uh, she continued uh, her life being celebrated, uh, not only uh, interiorly, but also in her, in her personal suffering, uh, which was really caused by uh, an attack of typhus that really cut her life short. And she did die on the evening of April 12th, 1920. Um, on April 7th, however, because of the danger of death, she did make her religious profession. Um, she was three months short of her 20th birthday and had yet six months to complete for her canonical novitiate uh, and to be legally uh, made a religious uh, sister. Uh, she did die, however, a Carmelite novice. Uh, let's talk about briefly her beatification. Well, we know that she was beatified in Chile by uh, Pope John Paul II, now Saint Pope John Paul II, in uh, 1987, and then was also canonized by him uh, just five years later in 1992-93. Um, um, the remains are venerated, as you said, at a sanctuary where uh, in uh, Los Andes, where thousands of pilgrims seek her guidance mm -hmm. and her direction uh, because they felt that she had a direct way to God. Mm -hmm. They really recognize in the simplicity of her life, even in her embracing her suffering and her death, that she, there was this direct conduit to God. And so they seek her out. And so to this day, thousands of pilgrims uh, visit there. We know that um, she is considered a great saint uh, in uh, European capitals. Uh, she is uh, the fourth Saint Teresa uh, to uh, be uh, celebrated. We know that with uh, Teresa of Avila, well known to us, Teresa of Florence, and then of course the little flower, Teresa of Lisieux. So we see in these four great women uh, this uh, road of simplicity toward Christ. And of course, uh, she is being lifted up as the first saint uh, in Chile to be declared. Uh, I would like to read in closing the opening prayer that we use for her mass. It says, Lord God, you kept Saint Teresa faithful to Christ by living the gospel with joy and integrity. May her prayers help us to live in fidelity to our calling and bring us to the perfection you have shown us in your son who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. So we celebrate her short life as a Carmelite uh, novitiate, but also as one who dedicated her life of holiness to God. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, I've been volunteering for 18, almost 20 years for um, volunteer chore service for community, uh, Catholic community services. What I do is help the elderly in their homes so that they can stay in their homes. I do work from shopping to housework to yard work. Most of the people I see don't really have a lot of family, so then I become almost like their family. I think a lot of times the elderly in our society are forgotten, and that's unfortunate because they're a real important part of our community because they have so much wisdom to share. Doing this type of work is very rewarding. You can't put it into words because I learn so much from these people and you learn stuff about yourself too. You learn to see God in a, in a variety of people in a variety of settings. The other day she told me that every night she, when she goes to bed, she thinks about her little angel, when her little angel's gonna come and check on her the next day. And that's me, yeah. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book called Saints of the USA by Brother Marco Bucarelli. This book for children ages six and up will fascinate young readers as they learn more about the saints of North America. Those who read it will meet 10 figures who have lived lives of holiness as well as the Immaculate Conception of Mary, patroness of the United States. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224. The store is open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953-2443 or email at stpaulsbookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these saints of our time. There is a place where a total stranger will give you their blood. A place where someone you never knew will save your child from drowning. Where a person who doesn't look like you, talk like you, or dress like you will give you shelter after a flood. 
That place is called America, where we look out for each other. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. Welcome back to our show. Now we're going to talk about St. John Neumann. Uh, he has a very interesting life. Uh, we have uh, many firsts that we talk about in this series, and we celebrate his life as one of the first. But let's talk about his beginnings. He was born in 1811 in Bohemia, uh, which is now the, the Czech Republic. Uh, he realized a long cherished dream when he finally was able to come to the United States and also was ordained a priest in New York City in uh, 1836. So we see that at the age of 25, he's able to realize his dream, leaving what is now the Czech Republic, coming to the United States, coming to New York City, and uh, becoming a priest. Uh, four years later, as a priest, as a young priest, he joins the Redemptorist Order, and we're told that in that, he uh, moves beyond New York, and he ministers in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, as well as what at that point is the American frontier. He was the first Redemptorist actually to make religious profession in the United States. So you alluded to what will be several firsts uh, in John Neumann's life, but he is for his religious order, the first Redemptorist in the United States to make profession of vows. And, and of course we see that uh, in 1852, uh, at the age of 41, he's ordained a bishop, a bishop uh, in Philadelphia, where he worked uh, very zealously to establish uh, many parochial schools there and parishes of immigrants from Europe. And how important it was when, when many of them came uh, from Europe to the United States, to this frontier land, that uh, there were many of their own ethnic background who came with them or subsequently uh, followed. And so parishes were set up uh, for their need and for their um, uh, for their particular ethnic background. And so we see uh, him continu continuing that uh, for the immigrants that come from, uh, from Europe. We also know that um, uh, Bishop Neumann uh, inaugurated uh, what they call the 40 hours devotion uh, here in the United States. And for many of the folks uh, that are with us, probably remember 40 hour devotions where uh, a parish would have uh, several days where they would gather to uh, celebrate the Eucharist, uh, to hear uh, perhaps a talk uh, where they uh, would be surrounded by several priests who would be invited and then it would be a parish celebration. And so this devotion, uh, which was called 40 hours devotion, really kind of died out um, probably in the last um, 10, 15 years. But that was a devotion that, that he really began in the United States. Um, possessing special skills in languages, we know that um, he was certainly uh, someone who was able to relate to people of, of immigrant countries in 12 different languages. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the catechism uh, that uh, Bishop Neumann created. Well, we know that he uh, composes two catechisms in German and a uh, Bible history for use in parochial schools. So we, we know that there was a desire to transmit both the faith, our traditions, as well as the scripture, the two great um, you know, feet upon which the church stands, our, our scripture and tradition. And he wanted to make sure that people had a, a clear understanding of them. Uh, so the idea that it would be uh, developed for parochial schools, that it would be something you wanted young people to be able to learn the scripture and learn the teachings of our faith, uh, that was certainly very important uh, to uh, John Neumann. Uh, we know that he had a special love for uh, children. Uh, he had a special love for sisters, for religious sisters. Mm -hmm. And we know that, uh, again, as we've mentioned, a very special love for immigrants. Uh, if we get back to those uh, firsts, we know that uh, in his life, all of these ministries, the church examined his life and he becomes the first bishop from the United States to be canonized as saint. Uh, this canonization was done by Paul VI in 1977, but I certainly know that you're well aware of that. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, me and my uh, grandmother of happy memory uh, were there in August of 77, uh, where Paul VI 
uh, celebrated his mass of canonization. So that was a significant time in my life prior to my diaconate the following year. Uh, but to witness a canonization and a mass uh, where the Pope celebrates with faithful from around uh, the world uh, is really significant. And certainly we know uh, when we talk about um, the saints, we talk about uh, their, their impact in their life uh, within the church. We know that his impact uh, was significant because he really built up the local church and institutions that continue to share the faith especially with those who were young. Uh, he also had a tremendous uh, desire to, uh, to work with religious women uh, and built up those communities, not only within his diocese, but around the country as well. But he was very uh, interested in immigrants. And how important is that for us when we uh, welcome people, not only to our country, but also to our churches, that we have that sense of um, desire to invite them to be part of our larger family. Well, it, it is essential as we welcome people in and we, we often refer to ourselves in the Catholic Church in the United States as an immigrant church. Mm -hmm. uh, that we are a church that's built on all of those different immigrants that have come in years past and continue to come mm -hmm. and, and help us to work together to uh, reflect the beauty that is the family of God. Uh, but that welcome needs to be there. That welcome needs to be exhibited in, in inviting them into collaborative ministry, certainly inviting them into uh, an understanding and a knowledge, uh, an education, if you will, of the faith. Uh, we see certainly in John Neumann. Uh, it's interesting that as he's canonized, and you were there in, in 77, just one year prior in 76, we have the canonization of the first American-born saint, Elizabeth Ann Seton. And, and it's interesting that those two uh, great saints lifted up at that time were both involved in education, mm -hmm. both involved in the lives of children. Uh, she, uh, as, as a, a woman who starts a religious community, would have found in someone like John Neumann a great uh, uh, supporter of, of her sisters in, in their ministry. And, and so it, it does show us that great welcome and that great need to continue to pass on that knowledge and love of the faith. We know that in his uh, short eight years as uh, Bishop of Philadelphia, that he uh, worked tirelessly uh, dedicating uh, his life and his service to others. Uh, it was said that um, he likely collapsed on the Philadelphia street and died before reaching a hospital and he died out of sheer exhaustion. And so we know that this man of God, uh, whose life we celebrate as a saint, uh, continues to invite and encourages us to um, reach out to those uh, in Jesus' name to welcome the poor, to welcome the immigrant, and also to carry on the faith, to celebrate religious life, and we celebrate his life in this segment. And we thank you for being with us. Have a good day, and God be with you. Saints of the Americas was a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program hosts were Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle.